Good morning and happy Sabbath. Good morning. Wonderful, Sabbath. Yes, praise the Lord. That was wonderful. Let's do it one more time. Good morning and happy Sabbath. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Praise the Lord. Thank you. Thank you, um, Kim and um, Betty, for that uh, special music. You know, I've given up uh, because everywhere I go, I meet uh, some of our members. I was in Mishawaka this other day, and I was thinking, oh, I'm so far away from Bering Springs, and there I was in one of the boutiques, and someone says, how are you, Pastor? I was like, even here? <laughs> so I was happy to see you guys uh, this morning as well. What a wonderful, special music. And I was blessed, as Don said, with the music. It felt like I'm back home again. The music was so beautiful. Indeed, angels sang with us this morning and seeing familiar faces and uh, some of my friends here. It's such a wonderful, wonderful Sabbath. And as Don said, I was thinking, usually uh, speakers speak here for about 45 minutes to an hour, and back home, it's an introduction to a three-hour presentation. So he said, <laughs> he said let the Spirit speak. So, <laughs> no, we're not going to do that this morning. Uh, God, God is going to lead, and in, in a short space of time, God can bring his message home. Let's pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the fellowship that you have given us. We thank you for... Uh, the Sabbath, we thank you for your word. We thank you for many, many blessings that you have given us. As we are going to open your word this morning, we want to pray that your holy presence will be among us so that we can be able to learn, retain, and apply this message in our lives so that we can be drawn close to you and prepare for your soon coming. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So this morning we're going to be focusing on John chapter 4. Uh, if you have a Bible with you, if it is a digital device or a physical Bible, let's open to the book of John chapter 4. Now this is a familiar story you heard when the scripture reading was read, a little bit of a summary of what was happening. But what I love about the Bible is, no matter how many times you read a passage, you read a chapter, you read a story, it strikes you differently each time that you read it especially when you have some experiences that are going on in your life, because the book of experiences opens some of the jewels that are in the Bible that you won't be able to see when the times are good and when you are comfortable. So God has something that probably you may have not seen in this chapter, not because it's new truth, but it is because the light of God is shining on, upon the old truth so that we can be able to have a new experience. Amen? So before we start reading, I'm going to give a little bit of a background to the book of John. What I love to do, or what we're going to be doing today, we're going to be killing two birds with one stone. One is the message, and two is some pointers on how to study the Bible. So as we're going to be studying, one of the main key principles on how to study the Bible that you're going to see is the simplest one. Hear a little, and there a little. The Bible interprets itself. And it is my prayer that we Seventh-day Adventists will reclaim that title that our pioneers used to have, that we are the people of the what? The people of the book, the people of the word. It is unfortunate this, uh, this day and age, or this time that we live in, that most of our people, they're no longer identifying themselves as the people of the book. The knowledge of the Bible and how to interpret it is slowly dying away, which is a very, very, very heartbreaking thing to see in God's people. But we have a promise in the book, Great Controversy, on the chapter, Modern Day Revivals, that a revival of primitive godliness is going to be seen among God's people, such as never was in the apostolic times. So this revival is going to come before God pours out his judgments upon uh, the, the wicked ones. So I am hopeful and I believe with all my heart that this church, not only this local congregation, but our Seventh-day Adventist church, though defective and enfeebled it might look, it is God's tool that is going to use to finish his work. Amen. So a little bit of a background to the book of John. John was the last of the apostles to die. He died probably around 100 AD. And we are told that this is around the same time that he wrote the book of John. And why did he write this book? 
He wrote this book because there was agnostic influence that was infiltrating the early church. Now the agnostics, I was looking it up online, it says here the agnostics saw Jesus as a messenger bringing the special knowledge of salvation to humanity's imprisoned soul. This is an error. They believed that Jesus came to earth he didn't possess a body, a body like our own. Instead, the agnostics taught that he only seemed to have a physical body known as the heresy of docetism from the Greek verb to seem. So the agnostic belief is that Jesus didn't actually come in the body that the disciples saw him. Because even in the Bible, we are told, the apostles said, that which we have handled, that which we have seen, testifying that they saw Jesus with their own, with their own eyes. And the other belief that was, in, uh, that was creeping into the church is that Jesus was not fully divine. He was not the Son of God. He was not God. So now you know the background. Now the book will start to make sense. That's the reason why John starts the book saying, in the beginning there was what? The there was the Word. And the Word was with who? God. The Word was with God. And the Word was? God. Was God. By Him all things were, were, were made. All things were created. And then he goes on to say in verse 13 and verse, verse 14, that word became flesh and dwelt among us, among us. So you can see from the first chapter, John is setting the stage of what he's going to address throughout the book, throughout the whole entire book. And as we have looked at, it is because all these doctrines or all these errors were, creep, were creeping in to the church, in the early church. So John wanted to address those things. So whenever you study the Bible, when you look at a book, it is going to help you to understand the historical background and the purpose and the theme of the book, why the author wrote that book. And that will help you as well to be able to apply it to yourself. Because these things or these erroneous doctrines, they are coming into our church today. They are even in the Christian world today the things that John was addressing. Because there are some people that are starting to doubt the divinity of Christ. Or not starting. It no, no new thing under the sun. There are people who don't understand how Jesus was divine and how Jesus was human at the same time. We know that the spirit of prophecy said, be careful on how you make him too human because he's both divine and he's He's human. So I want you to see how dangerous these errors were. Because you remember, in Hebrews chapter 4, what does Paul say? We have a high priest who is touched with our grief. And he went through the same things that we go through here, and he overcame. So if you're an agnostic, and you say Jesus Christ didn't come in the body, in the human body, of course there's a lot of study that we can do to see about the nature of Christ. But let's scratch on the surface here. If you are to have an agnostic belief, then Jesus would not relate to you because he seemed to have a human body. You see how dangerous this belief was? Jesus cannot be your savior. Because he seemed to have a body. He does not even understand the things that we go through. So that's why John wanted to address this issue. Let's go to, to the fourth chapter of the book of John. It says here, When therefore the Lord knew how the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, Verse 2, though Jesus himself baptized not but his disciples, he left Judea and departed, and departed again unto Galilee. So in chapter 4, we find an introduction that Jesus was baptizing and he had baptized more disciples than John had baptized. And the translators of the King James Bible, they put in parentheses there that Jesus, he didn't actually go into the water and put the people 
in the grave of the water, but his disciples were doing the same thing. Before we move on to our actual story for this morning, I want to just highlight a few things about this. If you go a chapter before, which is chapter 3, verse 13, you find John, let me see if it's, it's, if it's verse 13, verse 30 actually, you find John saying something that is very key to our Christian faith. He said, he must do what? He must increase and I must decrease. So John got it. But Satan wanted to tempt John or the people that were there or the people that were working with John that there's a competition going on. Why were they counting the people that Jesus was baptizing? Why were they counting? Jesus didn't baptize himself in person, but his disciples were baptizing. But before, they were told by John that someone who is greater than me is going to come. And he is going to baptize them through the Holy Spirit. And he's going to to do great works. So John was just the forerunner of someone who was going to do greater things than him. But Satan wanted to set the stage up for jealousy and disunity among us, this same ministry. They were just different people, different roles, but the same ministry. That same danger is still here today. Satan hasn't changed. You remember Paul addressed the same, the, the same issue. When some were saying, I'm of Paul, and some were saying, I'm of Apollo. And Paul said, who is Apollo? Who is Paul? We're just servants. Someone planted and someone watered, and they, the harvest is of the Lord. So my friend today, this morning, if you are beginning to brew the spirit of jealousy in your heart because sister so-and-so has a gift and a talent in this area, why is not all the glory being given to me? Then there's a problem because the glory is not supposed to go to sister so-and-so and brother so-and-so. The glory is supposed to go to who? To God. Why did Jesus baptize more people than John? Because it is the same work, and all the increase goes to, goes to God. I love the parenthesis that was put by, by the translators. It says, though Jesus himself baptized not but his, but his disciples. You know, it's a beautiful thing that every good thing that we do, every success that we get, it is attributed to Jesus if you are on the right path. Everything that you do. As a Christian, as a son and a daughter of God, everything that you do, when there is success and it's done by the right spirit, Jesus is glorified. And whatever happens to you, remember the Bible says, you are an apple of my of my eye. So whatever happens to you, if Satan wants to destroy your life, if there is somebody that wants to be, that is open to be used by the enemy and they try to hurt you or to harm you for no reason, Jesus takes it as it has been done to him because you belong to, to him. You remember when he said, whoever does all these things to these little ones, He has done it to me. So let that thought be in your mind. It is a comforting thought. It is also a a thought of responsibility that when we walk in this up and down the streets and in the malls and in the bars and the highways, we are ambassadors of Christ. Whatever people see us doing, they will just say, look at those people that claim to be Christians. Look at those people that claim to be the sons and daughters of God. But if it is a good thing, then we will have given a beautiful testimony to the world about the Christ who reigns in our hearts. Amen? Amen. The story goes on to say, Jesus left Judea and departed again into Galilee, and he must needs go through Samaria. What do we know about this place, Samaria? Samaria was a very, very interesting place. I was doing a little bit of study 
um, you will see that the Samaritan woman gives, gives us a very detailed explanation of the relationship that was between the Jews and the Samaritans. Some of you have read the story already. You know it already. You have done this study already. But as I was digging in, I learned that geographically, Judea was to the south, and Samaria was in the middle, and Galilee was to the north. But because of the tensions that were between the Samaritans and the Jews, there were Jews that would rather choose a longer route and avoid Samaria when they were going to Galilee. But this route that Jesus took was the shortest route that every Jew could have used. Because Jesus didn't mind going through Samaria. And the verse actually is more specific. The, vo- the verse says, Jesus must needs go through Samaria. And if you take a look at the life of Jesus, every single thing that he did, every single place that he visited, every single deed that he did, it was to fulfill that which was written in the prophecies. Of course, we don't have a single prophecy that is very direct and very clear in the Bible that Jesus was supposed to go through, through, through Samaria and do some deeds as it was prophesied. But you're going to see that there were some significant things that we glean from the Old Testament that makes this place unique and very interesting. Let's read on verse 4 or verse 5. Then cometh he to a city of Samaria, which is called, what was the name? Uh, Let me hear your voices. What was the name? Sychar. Near to the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son who? To his son Joseph. So one other thing that I would like to share with you when you're studying the Bible is to find the definitions of the names, whether it's people's names, it will give you an insight in the message that that person was supposed to carry or the message or the things that were related to the story that are pertaining to that particular place. So Saika means drunken, hilarious, deeply drunk, madness, falsehood, deceit, deception, disappointment, foolish, impious, ungodly. So this is what the the, the name of this town means. Ungodly, confused, drunken. This shows you the condition of this city. It kind of reminds us of Babylon and all the wine that all these nations are going to be drunk with. So how is it that these people had named that city drunken? Or you might think probably it was the Jews that named it that way. We don't have, we don't have clear explanation. But you know, as I was thinking, these people had accepted this name, Sychar, and started using it and identifying with it. You know you can be so engrossed in sin that it ceases to be sinful in your heart. And you start identifying with sin. Have you ever met people who say, I have a bad temper, my temper. And they don't see a way out. They identify with sin as one of their character traits. I just hate. I don't know. I cannot help it. This is just me. No, it's not you. God did not design you that way. I'm just jealous. No, it's not you. The worst thing that can happen in your life is to think that you have no way out and you start identifying with sin. Your identity is not rooted and ground in any of the things that God despises. Your identity is in Jesus. If you start feeling or sensing or recognizing that you are in deep sin, that you feel like you have no way out, cry like what what Peter did. Lord, save me. Lord, save me. And the other thing that I was thinking is, Jesus must needs go through Samaria. And he said, I have set you an example. 
And you and me are to do exactly as Jesus did. You know, there are places and people that are avoided by other people because of their bad character. Like, I will never step my foot at the sister or brother so-and-so's house because them and I, we don't get along. Why? You might have the right reason. They compromise. They don't speak well of people. You want to avoid them? That might seem like a very noble reason in your mind, but Jesus went through Samaria. He went through Samaria. I'm not saying go in places where it's going to be dangerous for you to be. If there is abuse and violence, for sure avoid those places. But if it's just character, you must ask God to go ahead of you so that he can prepare a way because he knows He knows because he was with the Samaritan woman and you can see that throughout the whole story, Jesus Jesus does some incredible evangelism and he brings out those evangelism tactics that we can be able to use with those that don't believe or that are prejudiced. He must go through Samaria and he's at Sychar. This place The Bible tells us it was near to the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son, Joseph. I'm going to dwell there a little bit more. This, this, uh, This ground that was given to Joseph. It is very significant to this story because we're going to see that the Samaritan woman was stuck with the history and all the things that had happened in the past to an extent that she was neglecting the work that needed to be done in her heart. This same place, this same place, if we turn into our Bibles to the book of Genesis, chapter 33, verse 19 to 20. Let's go there. Verse 19 to 20. The book of Genesis, chapter 33, verse 19. If you're there, say amen. Amen. All right, I'm still hearing the pages. All right, Genesis chapter 33, verse 19 to verse 20. The Bible says, And he bought a parcel of a field where he had spread his tent, and the land of the children, uh, at the hand of the children of Hamor, Shechem's father for a hundred pieces of money, and he created there, not he created, and he erected there an altar and called it El Elohi Israel. So this is the account where we see Jacob buying this land from Shechem's father, and he named it El Elohi Israel. That is very important to note. Jacob buys this land and he names it this name. And that principle that I shared with you earlier on, look up the meaning of the names. That name means the God of Israel. And if you dig deeper a little bit, it means a God who is separate from other gods of these nations that surrounded Jacob and the people of God. So we are told here in the book of John that remember, this, this is the parcel of, the, of land that was bought by Jacob. God gives us clues so that we can wrestle in our minds, thinking, okay, so why is it that the Bible here, why is it John is mentioning that account? Why? What's significant about Jacob buying this parcel and giving it to to Joseph? Because John, what he's saying here, go back to the account when it was bought. You will see that God's, God's instruction was you are supposed to be separated from the gods of the land. There is one who rules above every other god. 
There is an almighty God which is, who is superior than the gods of the land. And you know, by this time, Samaria was infiltrated by all these doctrines and all this, this, uh, this, these things and idolatry and everything. So John is reminding us that this was, this was the purpose. Let's find another account where we find this, this land. Before Joshua died, let's go to the book of uh, Joshua, chapter 24, verse 21 to verse 27. Before Joshua died, he did something in this same land. As I have said to you, today we're going to kill two birds with one stone. If we don't get to finish this whole story, it is my challenge for you to be like the Bereans, to go and study it and finish it and see how God can be able to bring some gems and some things that you may, never, you may have never seen in this story. The book of Joshua, chapter 24, verse 21 All right, I'm going to read verse 1 first before we read all these verses. So we have heard that from, from the book of Genesis that Jacob got this land from Shechem's father. So now we're going to hear more about this land. It says here in verse 1, And Joshua gathered all the tribes of Israel to Shechem and called the elders of Israel and for their heads and for their judges and for their officers and they presented themselves before God. And we go to verse 21. So he had gathered the elders of Israel there. Joshua was about to die, and he was reminding them of the history of the journey from Egypt to where they were now. And he goes to verse 21 and says, And the people said unto Joshua, Nay, but we will serve who will save the Lord. And Joshua said unto the people, Ye are witnesses against yourself that he have chosen you, the Lord, to serve him. And they said, We are witnesses. Now therefore put away, said he, the strange gods, which are among you, and incline your heart unto, unto the Lord God of Israel. And if you go to the, <clears throat> to the end of the chapter, verse 32 it says here, And the bones of Joseph, which the children of Israel brought out of Egypt, buried they in, in Shechem. And in that parcel of ground which Jacob bought of the sons of Hamar, the father of Shechem, for a hundred pieces of silver, and it, became, and it became the inheritance of the children of, Je of Joseph. So you see the connection here. This same land is the, the, the land that Joshua brings the elders of Israel and he makes a covenant with them. And there in that land, that was the first place where the sanctuary of God was. The sanctuary of God stayed in Shechem for a while and then it was moved to Shiloh. Then it was moved by David to Jerusalem. So in this land, here, where Jesus meets the Samaritan woman, it is a very significant land in the Bible. And you can see the, the theme here from Jacob. He says, oh, this land is called El, El Lohi Israel, the God of Israel, who is greater and superior than any other God. And you see Joshua doing the same thing, calling the children of Israel, their heads, to that same land and making a covenant with God that they will not follow the gods of the people that were around them. And the people said the same thing which their father said at the foot of the mountain. We will do what God has said. They made a covenant. And when Joshua had died, the children of Israel buried the bones of Joseph right there in that land of Shechem. What was significant about the bones of Joseph? It was because of the promise. If we go back to the book of Genesis chapter 50, from verse 24 to verse 26, we find Joseph about to die. We're not going to read it now. Joseph is about to die, and he said to his brothers and the Israelites, 
he said to them, Surely God will visit you, and he will take you out of this land, and you will go to the land of Canaan, which he promised to your forefathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And when, you, when God visits you, remember this. He was very detailed. Remember this. What are you going to do? You're going to carry my bones and go with them to the land of promise. That was a specific instruction, and that was an instruction of hope. So when deliverance came, God using Moses and Aaron, when they were about to go out of the land of Egypt, they took the body or the, bond, the bones of Joseph and they went with them. They finally got to this land. And after God had settled them in Canaan, there in Shechem, they had buried the bones of Joseph, fulfilling the promise that was given to the fathers. But if you remember in Patrick's and Prophets, it says Moses on the Mount of Pisgah, when he was being given a panorama view of what was going to happen, he saw the literal canon first and saw the apostasy that was going to come through, through different things that the children of Israel compromised. And he saw the Christian world and he saw beyond that, he saw the people of God, Jesus coming for the second time and them receiving the heavenly canon. So the promise that was given by Joseph, carry my bones, it was a fulfillment of the literal fulfillment of the deliverance and the settling in Canaan. But now you're going to get to see how all these connect. Jesus is there in that land for a reason. Because that land, as the bones were buried there, it was a testament to show that God keeps his word. But the promise went beyond just the literal Canaan. The promise was going to go to the heavenly Canaan. Amen? So Jesus is there to make you see that there is something called the transfer of the covenant. And if you haven't heard that, the transfer of the covenant is during literal Israel in the Old Testament, God fulfilled his promise promises literally to a literal geographic place, to literal Israel as a nation, and literal things happened. But when Jesus came, when he died on the cross, the covenant was transferred. I'm just going ahead of myself here. Remember when Jesus said that Samaritan woman, we we're going to read it word for word, but he said, now is time that God will not be worshipped in this mountain or in that mountain. But where, where, where is he going to be worshipped? In spirit and in what? In truth. So this is the reason why Jesus was explaining that. Because the transfer of the covenant, when you are interpreting Bible prophecy, it says literal, local, and worldwide spiritual. Jesus being crucified, being the pivot that you move from types and symbols going to anti-types and the fulfillment of the prophecy. So now this, all this introduction that John is giving, it is not just to give you a, a thought that John was very acquainted with the, with the, with the geography of the land that he was talking about. But every single word in the Bible, every single phrase in the Bible, every single line and sentence in the Bible, it's there for a reason and for a purpose. The spirit of prophecy says, if we rush through the study of the God's word, we will not get the depth that God wants us to get. Because we are so busy. We read a verse or we read a devotional thought and we are off to our duties. But if we spend time in Scripture and line upon line and precept upon precept, there are some things that we start to see in the Scripture that we will not get with surface reading. So Jesus is there for a reason and for a purpose. The sanctuary was there. And when Joshua had made a covenant with the people, he took a great stone and laid it against an oak tree, which was by the tabernacle of God. If you go back to the book of Joshua chapter 24. Who is the tabernacle of God? Jesus is the tabernacle of God. We see that in Revelation chapter 21. 
Behold, chapter 21 and chapter 22, when, we are, when the new Jerusalem is being described, behold, the tabernacle of God is, is among men. Who is the rock of ages? It's Jesus. So you see what Joshua is doing there. He's saying this covenant that you have given yourselves, that you have said we will obey God and separate ourselves from the idols of this land, you are not going to do it with your own power. It is going to be through Jesus Christ. You're not going to do it with your own power. So Jesus meets the Samaritan woman at that same place. And it says here in the Bible, verse 7, John chapter 4, verse 7. But before we go to verse 7, verse 6, now Jacob's well was there, Jesus, therefore, being wearied with his journey, sat thus on the well, and it was about the sixth hour. We're not going to go into detail on this verse, but there's quite a lot that you can glean in, that we can glean from, from that verse. But I want to just point what John is doing through this verse. He is saying Jesus got tired, which is something that we as human beings go through. So if it was, if the agnostics were true, then Jesus couldn't have gotten tired because he didn't have this, the, the body that, that we have. He could not relate to us. And if you read on the story, it says, Jesus said, can I have some water from the Samaritan woman? And the Samaritan woman, I love this. Let me read it. Let me read it. Verse 7, there cometh the woman of Samaria to draw the water. Jesus said unto her, give me to drink, which means that Jesus was limited. He could have just said, water, come out, and I need to drink. For, this, for his disciples were gone away unto the city to buy meat. Verse 9, then said the woman of Samaria unto him, how is it that thou being a Jew... Ask it to drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria, for the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Verse 10, And Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knowest the gift of God, and who it is that said to thee, Give me drink, thou wouldest have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. Verse 11, The woman said unto him, Sir, Thou hast nothing to draw with, and the well is deep, from whence then hast thou that living water. So look at what John is doing here. He's saying, I have told you that Jesus got tired. I have told you all these things about Jesus. But there is another person that is an eyewitness from Samaria who actually recognized that Jesus didn't have something to draw the water. And she testified to that fact, that he was a real person. He couldn't have gotten the water because he didn't have something to draw with. There was an eyewitness, someone beyond his disciples, right there. And she testified that Jesus was, had human limitations. Of course, Jesus was traveling, and he had gotten tired, and it was the heat of the day, and he was thirsty. But Jesus says something that is very, very important. The Samaritan woman had put ahead of her, or in front of her, the barrier that was always there, that the Jews and the Samaritans had no dealings. Why was Jesus asking him for a favor? If you go to the book Desire of Ages, it says... The act that the disciples had done to go and buy some food was permissible because there were some things that they could do, but asking a favor between these two groups was considered a no-no. So the Samaritan woman is reminding Jesus that, hey, what you're about to do, this is not supposed to happen because of the tensions that we have between the two groups. It is not. You know, it's unfortunate that in the church, 
we might think that probably we are far removed from this kind of setting between the Samaritans and the Jews. But we have it in our church in different forms. There is the conservatives, there is the liberals. I hate to use these words, but if you go in these circles, you hear talk about the other group. You hear it. And try and mingle these two groups together. It is only going to take a miracle and a revival and reformation for God's church and God's work to be united. It is going to take Jesus to be able to unite it. If you are here, if I'm here, and still have this kind of mindset, then we haven't started searching our hearts because Jesus, there's not going to be a heaven for the liberals or a heaven for the conservatives. There is going to be one single heaven. One single heaven. I want to draw your attention to something that I saw in this story that I had never seen before about this lady. Do you know that the Samaritan woman was a theologian? She knew her stuff. She knew her history. Look at this. She explains to Jesus why he shouldn't be getting this favor. And if you go to verse 11... It says, oh, verse 12, after she had said, you have nothing to draw the water with. She says, art thou greater than our father Jacob, which gave us this well and drank thereof himself and his children and his cattle. She knew her history. And if you go to the Old Testament, you don't have any reference of Jacob digging this well, which means this is passed down tradition or passed down information you know, John himself actually says if everything about Jesus were to be written, no book could contain it, or it was even bigger than no human being could be able to carry it. So there are some pieces of history that were passed down through oral tradition that we don't have in the Bible. But you see glimpses of them, especially in the book of Hebrews chapter 11, you see some of the things that Paul talks about, that he adds more information of things that we don't see in the Old Testament. And even in the book of Psalms, we see David sharing some of the things about the journey of, of the Exodus that we didn't see in the Pentateuch. So this lady actually provides us more information that we don't have anywhere else in the Bible to find it. She says, Jacob gave us this well, he drank from it, and his children, and his cattle. So this well is special. What she is saying, what I understand, is saying this place is so special, and we have it here in Samaria, which makes it superior than you have at Jerusalem. Because who was Jacob? Israel. That's where they get their name, Israelites. I tell you, my friends, there are some people here or in our church who know history better than they know Jesus. Who know church history so much? Do you know when we put these pews? Do you know when we dug the foundation of this church? Do you know this area had a single church? We evangelized this place. We planted this church. The Samaritan woman could do the same thing. She could do it. She knew Jacob. She knew the fathers. This was said by our pioneers. If you stop there, it is not going to be the full circle of salvation. This woman was a theologian. Look at this. She goes on to say, the woman answers and says, I have no husband. But uh, let me see. Before, before, she, before she said that, before she said that, Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water, this water that you're saying, it is so precious because it is from Jacob. You have that Bible that was handed down from your great, 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 great parent that was at an evangelistic series that saw Ellen White in a vision. You have that Bible somewhere. But that Bible, if the words that are closed in that Bible 
don't make a difference in your life. It doesn't mean anything. All that history that you have, if they don't, that does not lead to a transformed life, it means nothing. Let's read on. Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again. Jesus, I love Jesus. Because here, he doesn't go outright rebuking the lady. He just increases her interest. Although he could have shut the conversation. He could have just said, hey, you have said it right. I am greater than Jacob. And this is nothing. I am the one who gave Jacob. I wrestled with Jacob before he was converted. I am the one who created the water that came out of Jacob's well. <laughs> he could have said that. But Jesus is very patient. Learn evangelism skills from Jesus. Very, very patient. Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst, shall thirst again. The things that you have held held on to, they're, going to, they're not going to bring true satisfaction. The things of this world are not going to bring true satisfaction in your heart. The houses, the cars, all the properties that you have, you will thirst again. That's why we have billionaires that keep on making more billions on top of billions to make you see that these things, they don't bring satisfaction. If you drink of this water, that you're just seeing the works of the outside, the, the outside works of people that have come before you, you will thirst again. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst again. Praise the Lord. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing unto into everlasting, everlasting life. Praise the Lord. The water that Jesus gives you, even if you have nothing on this planet Earth, you're going to be the happiest person. And that water, when you have been satisfied, you become a fountain of, of living water. Fountain of living water. Because what's going to happen in your life, you cannot contain it. If you still see yourself being selfish and wanting everything for yourself, to you, and by you, then there's a problem. You should seek the living water. Because when you drink that water, you cannot contain it. We, we see the effects of the water. When the Samaritan woman got the water, what did she do? She couldn't contain it. She just left the, 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 the pitcher there, and she ran. She didn't even ask for instructions to him. What am I going to do? What am I going to say to them? No, she was, she was so excited. She left and she ran. So if you're still seeing yourself being selfish, something needs to happen. You haven't drank the water of life. Or probably you have drank it before, but you have deviated from it, and probably you have backslidden. But Jesus wants to give you this water. And it's not only springing into others. It springs into everlasting what? Into everlasting life. Jesus wants to give you everlasting life. Will you let him this afternoon, this morning? Jesus wants to give you that peace, that inner peace, that you will drink from the fountain of life, from him that will give you peace and happiness and joy. All the things that are troubling you in your heart today all that anger that is in your heart that you cannot forgive people, God wants to take it away from you and give you satisfaction. Ministry of Healing, chapter Mind Cure, the opening paragraph says, the pen of inspiration, the relationship that exists between the mind and the body is very intimate. When one is affected, the other sympathizes. There are many who are sick and don't know the cause because it's coming from here because there is no inner peace. And it's amazing, it's amazing that the next chapter, Jesus meets that person at Bethesda and he asks him, will thou be made what? Will thou be made whole? 
And it's fascinating. I'm here to study this. All these chapters, chapter, chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3, chapter 4, and chapter 5, have something to do with water. You, you remember in, in chapter 3, Jesus said to Nicodemus, unless you are born again with, through, through the grave of water, you cannot, you cannot see the kingdom of heaven. And in chapter 4 here, we see he meets the woman at the water. And in chapter 5, we see he meets that gentleman by the pool of what? By the pool of Bethesda. And in chapter 1 and chapter 2, we see Jesus' baptism. So I'm giving you a challenge. Go and find a relationship between these, these kind of encounters and what Jesus is saying through the book of John. We read on, the woman said unto, unto him, Sir, give me this water that I thirst not, neither come hither to draw. I want you to, to just zero in and look into verse 15 and just think and see what was wrong here. Jesus could have just given her the water. But what was wrong here? The last part is the clue. Neither come here to draw. And we see the condition of the woman as they are going to continue the dialogue that she was living an adulterous life. And some commentators say the reason why she was there the sixth hour, which is midday, is because a lot of people didn't go that time to fetch water because it was the middle of the day, it was too hot. So that was her opportunity to go unnoticed by people and be reminded of her works and her lifestyle or probably people who were angry with her because of her lifestyle. So she's saying, oh, I don't have to draw again and come here and be embarrassed by the things that I do. So I want your water. It's going to save me from all this embarrassment. Did she want Jesus' water for the good reasons? No. There are so many times that we take God's blessings and abuse them and have them serve our own selfish interests. Right there. You could have said, oh, evangelism was done. She wanted the water. So the Holy Spirit leading you, when you're having Bible studies or when you're spreading the gospel, know exactly, know exactly where and when to keep pressing and get that final decision that is total and full surrender to Jesus. And even in your life, why do you want that blessing? Why do you want God to answer your prayer? Why? So that you can look superior to, 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 your, to your neighbor? Why do you want that car? Why do you want that house? Is it because that other friend of yours has a big house, so you want a house that looks better than them? You can ask for God's blessings for the wrong reasons. Let us search our hearts. And Jesus, Jesus is amazing. He could read the heart. And Jesus is like, okay, it's enough. We're just going to go to the chase. We're going to go to the root of the issue. Jesus said unto her, go call thy husband and come hither. And the woman answered and said, I have no husband. And we're back to square one again. She's now going back and forth with Jesus. Jesus said unto her, Jesus is not wasting time at this point. Thou hast well said, I have no husband, for thou hast five husbands, and he whom thou now hast is not thine husband. In that saidst thou the, the truth. Jesus didn't go into a sharp argument, iron sharpening iron with her. He said, you have said well, you don't have a husband. Because... All these people, you have just, all this life, you've just been living an adulterous life. And the woman said unto him, Sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. Our fathers worshipped in this mountain, and he said that in Jerusalem, look, there, there are the contentions between the two groups, is the place where men ought to worship. Have you ever, have you ever been in a discussion with someone and they see exactly that you are right. And then they bring another issue. You know that at the time you did this. <laughs> like, let's, let's finish this one first. Right? Let's finish this one first. They keep go going in rabbit holes. 
But you know, Jesus is a master on helping you how to navigate those waters. The woman did the, sa- the same thing. You know, Satan doesn't give up easily. She's convicted right there, and Satan dishes her another reason for not being converted and not taking heed of Jesus' word. He will keep on doing that even today. There's no new thing under the sun. And Jesus said unto the woman, Believe me, the hour cometh when he shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. Ye worship what you know not. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. I don't think we have enough time to dig deeper into what Jesus said here. But what Jesus was saying, you find it in the book Desire of Ages. It says, on this mountain that the woman was referring to, they had built a sanctuary there before, in that mountain. That sanctuary had been destroyed by other nations because of their apostasy. And they kept on hanging to that mountain. But we know for sure that where God had chosen to be worshipped was through the sanctuary that was at Jerusalem. And that was the one that was pointing to the fulfillment of prophecies as Jesus being the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. So Jesus, what he's saying, he said, I'm not going to let this slide. I'm just going to tell you that there can be Christians, good Christians out there, and there can be people who try you in the church, but we, the Jews, know what we worship, and they don't. The fact that there's people that give, give you a hard time in the church doesn't remove that this church has the truth of God. It does not. You may see everyone as evil is against you, and you walk out there, you find some really nice, wonderful people that will smile at you all day out there. Don't be tempted to go out of the truth of God. This church, though defective as it may be, it is God's chosen agency that is going to finish the work. Jesus made it clear. He could have said, oh, these guys, they want to kill me. The reason why he was on that way is because those people, he actually left Judea because of the Pharisees. Why is he defending them? Why is he defending them at this point? But Jesus doesn't deviate from the truth because of his emotions. He knows the truth is the truth is the truth. No matter how I feel today, no matter how I'm going to feel tomorrow, no matter how sister and brother so-and-so is going to treat me, the truth is the truth is the truth. Stay in the church. God will do great and wonderful things through his people. And he said, but the hour cometh, now it is when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in what? In truth. For the Father speaketh such, seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. The woman said unto him, I know the Messiah cometh, which is called Christ. One more resistant effort. The woman tries to play a card here. When he is come, he will tell us all things. In verse 26, Jesus said unto her, it was done. Jesus wasn't wasting time. I that speaketh unto thee am he. We're going to finish here. You know that last part is very interesting. The woman said, she's convinced beyond beyond the shadow of a doubt that Jesus was a different person. He had met all her objections. One last try, Satan, to get this woman not to, not to be converted. One last point in her pocket. No, we know the Messiah is going to come. When he is come, then I'm going to be serious about salvation. Not today. Not today. Does, does that sound like Adventists? When the sun, the law is going to come, we're going to be serious about our relationship with Jesus. When the signs of the times are going to intensify, didn't you hear in the spirit of prophecy, it said the last day events are going to be rapid ones? They're still a little bit slow. Just, just 
don't be over zealous. You know, we have been here for quite a long time. When it's going to happen, we are going to start preparing. You know, when I was little, my mom would go to town, and she would say, I want you to do this and this and this, clean the house and do this and do this. When I come, I need all these things done. And when you hear that gate opening, <laughs> and you have been playing all day, you didn't do anything. There's no miracle that you can clean a big house in three seconds. No, it's not <laughs> happening. It's not happening. So my friends, my brothers and sisters, now it is the time to prepare. The Samaritan woman said, when he has come, we're going to do the things differently. There's one person that makes me sad when I read it every single time, it's Pharaoh. He was asked by Moses, when do you want the frogs to go away? He said, tomorrow, one more night with the frogs. <laughs> Why? It's like, Pharaoh, people are sleeping uncomfortably. I don't like frogs, <laughs> let alone them being in my bed. And you hear the head of the state saying, no, tomorrow, we, I want the frogs to go tomorrow. Why do you want to sleep one more night with the frog? Jesus is right there saying, hey, I want to transform your life today. Amen. Tomorrow is not guaranteed. I don't say this to put fear in your, in your hearts so that you can accept Jesus because something might happen tomorrow. No. You may live to 100 years, but probably today is one of your incredible chances that can give you a wonderful advantage in this life when you follow Jesus. You're not supposed to be scared into salvation. You're supposed to go into salvation because the love of Christ compels you. Today. Today. That thing that you say, oh, I'm going to work on it tomorrow. No, today. I'm going to go and have that conversation, that unpleasant conversation so that we can reconcile our relationship today. Probably this week or this month. Don't leave it until next year. God wants to give salvation today. Amen. How many of you would love to have that everlasting water? Amen. Saying, Jesus, please give us that water. Let me see you by standing. and Let's have a prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you the reason why you bring us to church every Sabbath and to prayer meetings is for us to be drawn closer to you. Today we have seen your love in this story with the Samaritan woman. And I want to pray for my brothers and sisters that have stood saying they would love to have this everlasting water and become fountains that are going to bless others and spilling this water into everlasting life. I just want to pray for your power and strength. You know what each and every individual struggles with. You know their weaknesses. You know their strengths. And Lord, I want to pray for this church to be a beacon of light in this community. That a lot of people will see you in their lives and want to have what they have. To be like Moses when he came down from that mountain glowing with the glory of God. So help each and every one of them. If there be anything that is troubling each one in their hearts, may you deliver them through the name and the blood of Jesus Christ. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. May the Lord bless the reading of his word.